So, kijk, as ons nou um, in die vlees is, dan gaan ons nou allemaal in een rij staan, laat Marius allemaal op die kop soen. Maar... <coughs> Ja, ik zou ook bij je. Ik zou bij je gewonnen dat of het ik is of wie dat je wil is, maar dat dank. Um, ja, maar dank is om maar net voor je gehoorzaamheid, Mari. En ik denk, um, so voor mij is het maar net weer dat zo so bij je keer zoek onze reel. Ons zoek een reel waar volgens onze Heer wil dien. Maar Heer, is hier om niks aan de reel te zien. Hij, um, ons kan zeker zeggen, wel beginsels, maar hij is inviting us to relationship. And to hear his voice and to obey whatever he says to us. And that's the essence of following Jesus. And um, so it's not a rule. No rule can work. And what we normally do is if something happens supernatural, we want to make a recipe of that and, and think it's gonna, always going to work. So if I'm, someone's nose is closed, we, we kiss him on the forehead. Anyway, so. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> So this morning we uh, are supposed to be in Afrikaans, but we're not. And the reason for it is um, that um, God wants to talk to us about multicultural discipleship, multicultural body. Um, and um, so for those who doesn't know, Shofar as a, as a church group at a, at a, at a, at a, um, a conference and... Um, so we are trusting God just to receive a bit of an impartation of what happened there. And we are inviting everyone to journey with us, going through the sermons that was shared there, and also trusting God to bring something of that here on a Sunday morning and to our small groups. So <clears throat> if you haven't prayed for a word um, previously, you should start immediately because this morning's word was prepared around the bride. And I don't know if that's a good thing. But um, no, so this morning um, we are excited, but we're also sad. We are greeting Cecil and France this morning. It's their last Sunday with us. For those, just raise your hands for those who doesn't know you guys. And um, they, were, they were with us for this year and this year only. And uh, we, we, this is now us, not them. That's with them in the small group, truly believe they're not hearing God for moving away, but that's, um, no. Anyway, no, I'm just joking. So, France is going to George, and Cecil is going to East London. Um, so, what a blessing you guys were for us in our small group, and also in the friendships that flowed out of that, and your impartation to our congregation. And just had the privilege of being present with Francis' baptism on Thursday evening. And France, your testimony blessed us. It's still blessing me. Thank you that um, by sharing your story with us, I know there's a God working. And um, oh, it was just beautiful to hear your testimony and, uh, you know, and to see God walk, walking with you and with us as we journey together through the year. And... Um, so, so the sermon that was brought at Con Convergence at the conference was brought by Africa Maslope, and I want to invite you really go and search it. Um, for me, good, good, uh, just brilliant to listen to it. Um, challenging me in a way, um, I think one thing that challenged me is that um, we as the church or as small groups may be multiracial, but we are not multicultural. So the question is, what does that mean? So what it means is there is from different cultures, different ethnicity, if you want to be playing different colors in our group, but we, everything happens according to one culture. So you can have one culture, multi-ethnicity present, but it's still one culture. And I think it's true for us. We, even we experienced from people coming from an English background. So it's a different culture. Coming here, they may come to, we, we might, might have a bit of diversity, but everything is going according to Africana culture. And I think one thing that Africa said um, was that culture was created by man, not by God. 
all cultures, all over. If the creator is sinful, the creation is sinful. And in all of our cultures, doesn't matter who, me and Cicely had long chats around the Bri and around the Bible concerning our different cultures and we, how we can see sinful behavior in both of our cultures around the same topic. None of us has the truth. And how good it was for us to journey together in the groups and personally. Um, I loved what you said yesterday, Cecil. It stayed with me. And I hope it stays always with me. And that we want to overcome something of our past in this country. But we rarely get personal. And it is not to be solved in groups and big groups. It comes from where we personally get to know one another. And engage with one another. So um, in my, my last remark and then. I've asked Cecil just to share and what God wants him to share, I don't know, but um, just share from his story and from his experience in life and um, his walk with God. Um, when we had a bride together yesterday, we, we found common ground at at least three things. And um, the first one was that <clears throat> when it comes to Bri, um all of us love meat. Both cultures love meat um, in general. And the second is, there's something of our parents that um, is, is never, never happy, never satisfied. Um, so it says, in his culture, the ancestors, the, the only difference between parents that is not the Frieda or happy with us is that with them it's the dead, with us it's the, those who live. And um, so, so he says the ancestors are never happy. There's always something wrong. And many of our Afrikaans grew up in homes where things are never good. We are not good. And we, we grow up with that. And um, the only thing I thought afterwards, uh, Cecil, Cecil says, so they are slaughtering the sheep or the goat for their ancestors, but they eat the meat themselves. So it's, um, I, I don't know if it's honest, but at least when we sh slaughter the sheep, we know it's for us. We're going to eat the meat. <laughs> it's not for them. <laughs> I'm just joking. So, and, I, and, I, and, and I thought, it's so, so, so strange to think that in my, my unsaved culture, Afrikaner culture, brandy has a huge role around the bry fires. And interesting enough, Cecil says it's the same with his culture. It doesn't know where it comes from because obviously many hundreds of years ago there was no brandy in his culture. But today, any braai, any sacrifice, brandy is there. So we've got three things in common. Our parents are not happy. We eat the meat and brandy is there. But it's not God's culture. And uh, Cecil, so you, I'm not going to even share your story, anything of it. You, um, we appreciate you willing to share with us. And um, may God lead you. Lord, we thank you that you opened salvation for the Gentiles. Thank you that I was counted in. Thank you that the blood of Jesus was enough even for me. Thank you that my lineage, my heritage does not, was not a barrier to accessing you. I thank you for the giants of salvation you send in my culture and to my people to introduce Christ as who he is. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that saved my life. Amen. Amen. It's going to get personal. Um, I think my name is Cecil, but it's not really Cecil. <laughs> That's something maybe most of you that have been calling friends for a while been calling me Cecil 
Um, my name is Mandela. Okay. Um, so black people take namings very seriously, and that was the case with my parents. They decide to give me this name, which literally means the nation builder. Um, needless to say, I was very I'm like, this is very presumptuous. I <laughs> don't want this name. It's too big. Um, so I changed it. I changed my ID. I gave myself a name that I say is more scalable, even for white people. <laughs> um, but uh, I love Cecil for a number of reasons. One, it's scalable. Two, um, I always felt like it takes me out of the Tosa box and it puts me on a box that I defined. As soon as I say Mandela, okay, there are certain things you can assume about me, certain stereotypes you can neatly fit me in there and I will fit and you'll be right. Um, so I did not like that. I did not like being fitted in a box, I gave myself Cecil. Cecil is very simple. Cecil is scalable. It, you don't have to spell your name. You don't have to teach white people how to pronounce it. My friend's name is Olui, too, meaning our love. And you would always say, it's all where to. That's how you say my name, all way to. And for a number of years, it was called all way to. I, but I was also named after, I was born in Cecilia Makiwane. Cecilia was amongst the first black women to graduate as a nurse and uh, to honor the work she did in our community we decided to name one of the hospitals after her. And the story goes that she was living around the Alice area. And every time she goes to work, after work, she won't go straight to home. She was on a horseback, which is strange for black women. Um, she would pass through the villages that are in between the workplace and her village and she would help mothers who were pregnant with antenatal care. She would probably arrive at home at eight o'clock at night, busy visiting patients who couldn't go to the hospital themselves, bringing chronic medication to them. I love that story. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I like this name. It's quite fitting. Um, so I adopted it as mine. I won't talk about Cecil John Rhodes. I think as South Africans, we always have a very complicated um, history with the English. Uh, but um, today I want to talk to you as, um, as, a, as a child of God, firstly. Uh, above all, that should be at the center of my, whatever you're going to take out from my story. As you can see, I did not bring any Bible, any notes. I just want to share from my heart. And the danger with that is African people follow their own time. So if you quickly have to go warm chicken or something, it might take the whole day. We're working with African time tonight. It's a joke, guys. <laughs> But um, I was born in this small village uh, all my life. It's been around there. It's called Mdingi. I'm not going to teach you how to pronounce it. Forget it. Um, but it's uh, just outside King Williamstown, seven kilometers. When I want to be fancy, I tell people I'm from King Williamstown. Uh, but I'm not from King. I'm from around King Williamstown. And if you could see the two places, you would know why they are very different. Um, I think my community probably has less than 5,000 homes in our village. Uh, we're close to the great place of King Khakhabe. I will not teach you how to pronounce that. 
um, but he's, he's one of the tribal kings. Um, so the, as you can, as you are starting to pick up, it's, there's a lot of customary law. It's a very set way of doing things, and, and that's the background I come from. Um, I cannot share this story without sharing about my father, who encountered the Lord. As I think, as we are talking about the giants of faith who brought Christianity to even us Gentiles. There's one name that has always stood out for me. Um, my father would tell me of an evangelist by the name Nicholas Bengu. He used to have these crusades throughout the country called Africa back to God under the symbols of God. And it's, it's in, in that era where my father encounters the Lord, um, which changed, I think. Someone was saying there's very few decision, decisions one make in life that really change the entire direction of your life. And I think that's true. Over, over the days, I, you make minor decisions that are not so important. There's very few decisions that when you take, they change the whole game. And reflecting on my life, um, I think the decision my father took did not affect him. It affected me too. And it changed the whole direction of my life. Um, my father was a typical African man. He loved mkombo tea, um, loved drinking, was an alcoholic, literally by the DSM-5. Um, he loved smoking this tobacco. And he says when he encountered the Lord, he remembers going inside this lady's house who was staying across our house and she found us sitting on the couch and there's a small coffee table. Um, this woman was worshipping. He just got there and sat on the couch and the entire presence of the Lord as she was singing this chorus which says, You took the entire burden of my sins and you threw it in Calvary. Um, they sang this song in the spirit, and that's where he gave his life to the Lord. All the newspapers he used to roll his soul were on the table. All the box of tobacco on the table. And his whole life changed. A few years later, my sister is born. And I was born after her. And as a child develops, you, you learn, oh, she just started crawling. She just started walking. She just said her first word. These things did not happen in my sister's life. My sister had a condition called cerebral palsy. It's Greek. It literally means the paralysis of the brain. As such, she could not talk walk, speak, eat on her own, go to the bathroom. That changed our life as a family. It's difficult, to say the least, to be born with a sibling who has a, a disability. But I think it's peculiarly difficult when you're in the Eastern Cape with the access to health care. I think she, at some point she needed three different specialists. Um, physiotherapists, neurologists. I could say those names as a small rural boy because I was exposed to them. I remember my grandmother would come 
as my mom is spending time with her in the hospital, she would come. And this one time we are waiting to get inside the hospital to see my, my sister and my mom. My mom would spend, I think, if you had to tally up the whole year, you would realize that she spent most time in hospital or seeking for health than she did at home. That's the extreme of the condition she had. Uh, so my grandmother, my father, they were working together to raise us up. And now this one time I'm sitting with her in this long wooden bench inside the hospital. And she says to me, we're watching people going up and down, up and down. And she says to me, in Kosa, but I'll say it in English, but my child, why do you want to spend your life around dying people? I'm saying this maybe to give you context. I grew up knowing that I want to be a doctor because I was exposed to doctors. And I said to her, I want to be a doctor. And now the reason she's asking me this question, why do you want to spend the rest of your life around dying people? I recently asked myself the same question when I was writing my final exams. The answer obviously changes The answer is always different. Um, it's a question that doesn't have an answer, at least for me, that I can say it's honest. I managed to convince my parents to send me to the school, which was not in town. It was in a township just outside my village, because the one in town was way more expensive. It was called a former Model C school. I don't know what was a Model C. Um, but all I knew about Model C schools, they did not have black people. And uh, I guess things changed, which is good. I'm going to share this story with you because I think our relationship with God, this way, vertically, you and God, that's perfect. You worked it, and you've, you've grown spiritually. But you know where I think we struggle? With this relationship between you and your brother. Um, I struggled with it, too. Um, especially loving people who did not look like me. Um, I loved the Lord, but this was difficult. Uh, especially coming here, you might notice there's very, very few brown people who look like me. Um, that question really became strong in my walk with the Lord. And, and I think with the few people I've spoken with, it's a struggle we all have. We struggle to love our neighbors. We struggle to love our brothers. Um, before, before I see LB, I see a white man first. Yeah. We're going to take off our masks. And... You know, we might not take down the whole wall of racism and the heritage of our history. But today, I believe the Lord wants to take off brick by brick and reduce the walls that have separated us. We've built our walls in our country so high. And at the top, we added a bob wire. And at the very top, we added an electric fence. As such, the only businesses that are thriving are private security companies. And the reason for that is because we cannot see. The fact that I cannot see a 
friend in you. A brother and a father who is loving. It hurts the heart of the Lord. It's like having two children who are fighting always at war. And when they do speak, they are shouting at each other over social media. They are shouting, we cannot have a civil conversation. And I believe one of the wisdoms I learned here was I will not talk politics with you. I will not talk the EFF land expropriation without recreation because I believe that this is a privileged delicate conversation that can only happen between two friends who have loved each other dearly to be able to divorce themselves and put themselves on the shoes of the other and I stop arguing for black people. I stop arguing for African people. Now I argue for my brother. So unless you are my friend, unless you are my friend, we cannot have that conversation. So I want to help you guys also to build these friendships. Christopher is telling me how much of uh, how difficult it is to build these cross-cultural relationships, especially between the Kosas and the Afrikaners. By the way, I used to think all white people are white people. It's only in serious I read, oh, there's Afrikaners, there's English, and they really look at themselves very different from each other. Uh, you will excuse my English because my ignorance, because for a number of years I only grew around black people. Uh, the only white people we would see was when my mother in September is taking us to Sales House. It was under the Edgar's group to lay by our Christmas clothes. And then you see a white person. <laughs> So, it is weird because the only white people I saw were the ones that my mother was giving money to. And then we'd go back to my village. So, I only saw white people. I'm like, oh, the people that we give money to. You go work hard and you give them money. I want you to pee in that. Because for the very first time, as you will hear the story, I received money from a white person and it shook my life. It's hot. It was not nice to grow up in the Eastern Cape as a Christian family. So my father got saved. He was radical for the Lord. And they would go around these villages ministering the word of the Lord. And she, there's this lady who stays in my village. And she, she, she used to tell, tell her, and I would be there, tell her this, this story that you were dead for almost an hour and the Lord raised you up. And what the story was. So when a person in my culture dies in the house, you have to scream for the neighbors to come. I'm like, what is wrong? Like, oh, my child is not moving. You cannot diagnose death to your family member, yourself, because we'll think you killed her. 
So culturally, you have to go outside, scream, the neighbors come like, no, this is called dearth, and then the whole thing can start. But uh, over the, the years, um, we realized that our houses are not as tidy. So before you scream, clean up your house, and then go outside and start screaming. So this lady, her daughter dies. I'm like, oh, she's dead, and I have to scream. She quickly cleans the house. And she goes stand on her rendezvous at the door. She's trying to scream, but the voice is not coming out. My father and his friends are walking down the road, going to a different village. And he, he liked to tell the story so much. And the Holy Spirit directs them to go to this woman who is standing by the door, saying nothing. And as they enter, they realize there's a body in bed that's cold. And they start praying. And they shook the body. And she woke up. These are the stories I used to listen to about the work of the Lord. I remember hearing about a similar story where Christ is walking and she says to, she's raising this child, but she uses a beautiful Hebrew word where she say, where Christ says, Talita, arise, young girl. And I thought, oh, that's such a beautiful story. And every, every time I read that scripture where Christ is saying, Talita kum, arise, young girl, it, it always reminds me of that story. But it was not fashionable to be Christian. It was not nice. My my people, the Tosses, are very communal people. And we love meat. And we love our ancestors. And we love to make them ceremonies. Uh, my father had issues with eating meat dedicated to the dead. So every weekend, especially in December, there's always ceremonies that are happening. And... But I can't go have that meat. This is a problem. Uh, and, and there were terms for, for our family. Um, uh, it's called amakobog. That was the, the word that was used to refer to us. Uh, there's a folk. I don't know whether it's true or not. But uh, there's a... Uh, a story of a princess who was also a prophetess for the king and she's prophesying to the people that uh, white people will arrive by the sea carrying two things a book with red lips the bible and a button with no holes take the book and leave the button um, as you can imagine, in, in, uh, in the community, there were be people who believed in this book that had red lips and those who did not. So those who believed were called Amakobog, the believers. It's a derogatory term, <laughs> don't worry. Um, so that's how I grew up. One thing is... And then I go to high school with, with this two worlds in my head. You know, am I a Tosa man? Am I a Tosa? Or am I the child of God? And which one comes first? Because my day-to-day -to -day experience is Tosa. The people who surround me, my diet, my language, everything about me is influenced by my, it's called culture, by my culture. And here's my father, 
who now introduces this gospel about this Christ who looks white on the pictures that I've seen. And he says, this is good for us. This is the truth. And he was the only one saying that for a number of years. Very confusing time for a 13-year-old me. And I go to high school. And in high school, I wanted to do the math and the science so that I could be a doctor. They weren't teaching math and science in my village. Um, don't know why. Um, but if you were in our village, you would do geography. Afrikaans, weirdly. <laughs> and math literacy and agricultural science and you will go sort yourself out after that so i look at these subjects i'm like there's no way i'm gonna become a doctor with these so i left and in my journey my mother says look there's an aunt of yours who stays in this township you're gonna go live with her what she did not tell us that this aunt of mine is a Sangoma who is married to another Sangoma and who has a daughter who is called to be a Sangoma. And then I get to this. It was the biggest shack I've ever seen. A shack is like a tin house. It's so long. It's big. You could see it used to end there and then they divided. They extended it. It's... And if you know a thing or two about structures, if you're going to connect a lot of pieces together, you don't want that structure to be long because it starts looking like this. So I was staying with my aunt. My aunt was a weird one. Her husband one time is seeing lightning, like, you know, the bolts. And, and, and she believes, ah, the Sangoma over that mountain is challenging me to a supernatural fight. I will take it up. <laughs> First time seeing African spiritualism at play. Now, this is a very African conversation. My, why, you guys might not believe me. <laughs> but... Um, so there's, there's, there's this lots of lightning happening and this pa pa pa, And because we are in a shack, I mean, we could see the whole cosmos in our roof. We could see it's dark and in the shack with no windows. So when it's lightning, you, you see it light in your house. This guy gets angry. He's like, ah, oh, no, they're challenging me. So what he does, listen to this. Because I want you to know this. When God says, I am the Lord of lords, what he actually means is, there are other lords, but he is the Lord of them all. This could actually help you when you have to minister to us. At some point, you have to evangelize, and we tell you how powerful the Sangomas are. So this is what she does. He takes a nail cutter, goes to my aunt, clips her toenails, all ten of them. Takes ten nails in his hand, and he goes by the, you know, on the road. Then there's a stream of water because it's raining. Sometimes it makes this froth. So he takes this, these bubbles from this froth. He mixes them in his hand with, with these nails. And he adds some juju in there. He takes one nail, throws it in the sky. He calls some spirit, I'm sure. Like, Ambo! Quah! A lightning came. And I'm like, ah, no, it's a coincidence. <laughs> he threw it. Just before the actual lightning came, he takes the second one, 
calls the spirit. He throws it. Lightning comes. I'm like, okay, I'm watching you. <laughs> he threw all ten of them. And all ten made a bolt like lightning. Wah! That's the only miracle I've watched. So this is the type of setup I was staying at. Uh, <laughs> When I was there the first night, I was in a one-room shack. doesn't have much of a privacy. Um, my aunt says to me, okay, Cecil, you're going to have to choose where you're going to sleep tonight. And in the bed was my cousin. You can actually share the bed with your cousin. You'll sleep as Nyawin at her feet and then, you know. You know that type of setup where you're sharing a bed? Well, you guys won't know. <laughs> but uh, we actually do share beds among sometimes four people. Don't ask how we fit, but we do. I looked at my cousin. It was like you took a ruler, you put it under the bed sheets, and you lifted it. That was a body habitus. She was so thin. Only now I realize she was probably at stage four of HIV. But she never had any access to health. My aunt believed the ancestors have cursed her because she does not want to become a Sangoma. And yes, no one becomes a Sangoma because they want to. They get tortured by the spirit. Uh, she later died. A plot twist, she was also selling alcohol. It's not really umkombo, but it looks like it. Uh, you mix, I, I know that you put lots of sugar in it and a lot of yeast. And you let it ferment for a while. So my job, because I wasn't paying rent to live with her, was to sell this stuff. And I was selling it for two rand fifty. You drink that thing, it makes you pronk, 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 pronk. <laughs> um, and you can only imagine the type of people who will be drinking it. Um, but there's a gentleman I met there. Uh, he was different from the normal clientele we were servicing. He had this beard, glasses, always loved wearing a shirt, folds it, and was well spoken. Um, and he really loved drinking this stuff. I got to know him very well. In fact, I think. I still, till this day, consider him a role model of what not to do. Story goes, this man was educated at Forte, became a teacher, and when he's drunk, he would make sure you know that he has a bachelor's of education in teaching with honors from Forte, not a college. And he was so smart. He was clever. Because there's a difference, right? I think we have enough clever people. But he also loved reading. And here was I in this big shack. With this guy who loved to drink this thing. And obviously he would always be here. First time I entered his house, he was actually our neighbor. He had a beautiful structure on the outside. Brilliant architecture, nice windows. But when you enter inside, it was empty. You could tell there were tiles, but they removed them. Because what he had done... After becoming a teacher and rising up in government in 96, at the dawn of our democracy, he got involved with corruption, stole lots of money from the education system, 
because he's clever, right? And they found out and sent him to jail for a really long time. And when he comes out, everything he had was confiscated. And both his parents had died. He was, I think, looking back, drinking himself to the coffin, the way he drank that thing that I was selling. In his house, he had this empty shell, but at the corner was this pile of books with this old lazy boy couch, and he would read. First time I got them, I'm like, you have books. You don't look like the guy to be reading. You have books. Like, he said to me, take a book, open it. What page have you opened? I said, page 54. Read the first sentence. I read the first sentence. And he completed the rest of the poem for me. And he was sitting there. I was holding the book. I was marveled. And for the rest of that time in my aunt's Shibin, I spent time with him. And he would read the most beautiful classical poems for me. And he would teach me how to pronounce English words. <laughs> One of his favorites. He would say, oh, a, a word I learned was naive. I'm like, you're so naive when we're arguing. I could talk to him like that. I'm like, you're so naive. And he would say to me, it's not naive. It's naive. You are naive. Uh, and sometimes we'd read a poem and say, oh, the bird flies. I'm like, what? Why do you call it a bird? It's a bird. A bird flies. What do you call this? I'm like, it's a bed. And what's there? It's a bed. I'm like, no, that's a bird. This is a bed. <laughs> we had that relationship. Um, my family struggled to really get me through high school. Last time my mother worked, uh, it was in 1988, as a domestic worker. And then in 2012, with arthritis in her knees, she had to go back to it, close to 60. And she would come and say to me, Yo, Cecil, I knew white people were evil, but black people, they even make you mop with your knees on the floor with my arthritis. All those things made me, I think, angry, determined. And, and I realized dreams are fueled by a lot of things. Uh, for me, they were fueled by fear of poverty. I was very afraid of being poor. And that's something the Lord really worked hard to deliver me from. Another thing, yeah, uh, um, I finished matric, brilliant marks, yeah, gonna be a doctor. I uh, went to my aunt's ship in looking for my best friend with my metric marks in my hand. At that time, I was wearing this jacket and a white jersey because now I was head boy and uh, chairperson of the debating society. I had all these accolades in my breast. And I remember when I started collecting them, he used to say to me, 
the most important in all these is your name. Because my school puts your name at first at the top and would put prefect and whatever thing. And he said to me, the most important of these accolades is your name. Now I'm going to show him. But I'm going to be a doctor. I got the marks. I got the people doing the same thing they were doing when I was in standard six. And they tell me, no, we buried him last week. He's dead. I mean, the only man I wanted to see my marks, even before my father and my mother. I wanted my best friend who taught me Shakespeare, who taught me George Orwell's poems. He'd really love George Orwell. He would say, my boy, some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> And they would say, when I start complaining, like, you know what? When this country is not working, when it's your turn to lead it, what are you going to do? You will do what the horses did. You will pull harder. <laughs> when it doesn't work, you won't complain. You will pull harder. And what would the pigs be doing? It was that kind of a man. Um, yeah, but I did not get to medical school. And I know the issue of admission to medical school is a big issue for white people, especially white males. But what you didn't know, it's an issue for us too. <laughs> it's so hard. And I think, yeah, the smart people are really trying all their best to equalize, to redistribute, and to see who should come in and who shouldn't. Should marks matter when everyone has passed? But it's complicated. The issues of our country are complicated. And they cannot be discussed by politicians. They can't. But we can. Because what we can do, we can create pockets of hopes so that when you see, I don't want to say a black person, so that when you see your friend, ah, oh, there's something beautiful I experienced in Sirius over this year. I thought it would be cross-cultural relationships, but it was actually cross-cultural and transgenerational friendships. I never thought as a young man it's possible to have good friendship, like David and Jonathan style kind of relationship with someone older than me. And it's in this valley where I had that with my friend Niels. The Jonathans bring you in, in a, in a beautiful way. They make you survive a world you do not. They position you to see things differently. And if, if, if my talk were to be summed up in any way, I would love to encourage you guys, all of you, to have trans generational friendships and hopefully that they go beyond race. It's going to be difficult because people are hurt, people are angry, we think we are poor because of apartheid. We think we're poor because of Jacob Zuma. It's not going to be easy. And it can't. And it shouldn't be easy. But I want to dare you to do it. Find a young man filled with energy in his bones. And who thinks he's clever. And sit him down. 
and just share your story. Don't be afraid. Because it's, it's only in these honest conversations that I can now see you as a brother. That now I could also see you as a friend. It's only our friendships. Um, I always think of David as, as this kid from the wilderness who's weird, who dances in the woods, who kills stuff, is messy, not really liked by his father. And I see this Jonathan who's being raised up with good etiquettes from the king's palace. They teach him how to eat, how to dine etiquettely, how to dress. Um, preparing him, preparing him to be king. But he is man enough. He's, he is godly enough to go to the other side of classism, to go to the other side of you know, those communities were about class. So we don't associate with these ones. They're too poor. They smell. But this guy was big enough, humble enough to bring David in. I think probably their first encounter was about food because I love food. Showing him the delicacies of the, of the palace, how food is prepared and how candies... Are. I get that image, and, and I get to see the image of David as this wilderness will show you what wild berries to eat, and they're both important. And the weird thing about our country is that the founding fathers have positioned it in such a way that economic power and political power is not in the same hands. But for any of them to work, you need to have both. He's probably more likely to get a loan from a bank. But I'm probably better equipped to get business. What does that mean if we're smart? It means you'll be my Jonathan and I'll be your David. I think if you were to extrapolate the future of the country, it lies there. It lies there. We are different when we are with people who look like us. We, how you experience a black person when he is amongst other black people is different from how you will experience him. Or you experience a white person amongst other white people is different. This is why we need I mean schools and universities and the workplace have tried. And instead of speaking about friendship, it speaks about tolerance. You know, I will bear with you until four o'clock, then I'm out, you're out of my life. I only have to bear with you in this engagement and then it's done. There's a big argument in the workspace, the issue of the air conditioner. White people want it freezing cold. Black people want it scorching hot. And we have to do ridiculous things like having po an air conditioner policy for... Johnson Incorporated. How is the aircon going to be managed when it's 18 degrees outside? <laughs> write it down. How is the air when it's 40 degrees out? <laughs> write it down. And we think we're being clever, right? By creating more laws. Look, no, you can't say that about black people. It's racist. No, you can't pee on his laptop. It's wrong. It's clever stuff. 
and I'm asking you for friendship stuff. You know? They say, no, I can't do this on my friend's laptop. A white guy saying that to another white guy. You're not going to do that at my friend's thing. You know, when I'm with black people, I'm like, no, my friend lives there. I slept there last weekend. They're good people. And they're working that land very hard. Start with a garden first. A black person saying that to another black person for his white friend. That's the stuff that builds countries. I don't know how to end these things. Thank you, Cecil. I appreciate your honesty and just um, helping us to think and to see what we don't. I think um, one thing that I've learned over the year journeying with you um, is that we need someone outside our culture to help us see our own culture. We are not able to see our own cultures. And, and that's, that's where you get to our friendships. And maybe I'll, I, I hope I can end it this way. And, and, and my, my desire this morning is for all of us to allow God just to speak to you personally. Don't see Cecil when he speaks. Don't see me when I speak or whoever. Allow God to speak. I think cross-cultural or different cultures was a problem and a challenge for the church from the beginning. You read it in Acts 6 between the Greeks and the Aramees. They, they, there it started. But God always meant the body of Christ to be from different cultures not to be different cultures without friendships, but to be true friends amongst different cultures. And I, I want to leave a, uh, just a, a principle with us. I think many times in our country I see that we, are, we, we get negative and critical about any approach to be intentional about what we struggle with. So we would say, no, but if we are intent, it should happen, I don't know what we call it, naturally. It should happen organically. It should happen if we want to be spiritual by the Spirit of God. And I just want to leave with us, nothing unbiblical in your life changes and in my life changes without being intentional about it. So, so don't make it fluffy to say, no, it is, it's artificial. Be intentional about it and ask God how to change in this area. Any sinful behavior in my life only changes if I'm intentional with that sin. And I think most of our challenges with any sin is we struggle even to recognize it and to acknowledge it. And before that doesn't happen, there's, there's no chance for change. And um, so, so, so this is not new. It's not new to South Africa. It's all over the world. It's all over the church. And I want to in, in, invite you to be intentional about it. To be intentional about it. Every victory over any sin takes intentionality. It takes prayer. It takes repentance. It takes a change of thought patterns. It takes accountability. And it takes new actions. Anything that changes is asking for this intentional attitude from us as believers. And I want to leave us to respond. And just ask Lord to speak to you personally about this. And I, I want to encourage you to be accountable to someone about it. And to be intentional about it. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you 
for bringing Sissel for a season amongst us. But I pray, Lord, that this will not be the last. And I pray that there will be an impartation this morning for us to be intentional about friendships, our personal space, our homes, our community, different cultures amongst us. We need your spirit, Lord. As this will have said, we don't need more laws. We need your spirit to change us and to lead us. And I pray that we will, in a year's time, be together and look back and say, thank you, Lord, that you have grown each one of us in this area of our walk. The wholeness of individuals and our families and our country needs your word and your spirit to walk through to work through all of us. And we ask for it this morning, Lord. I pray that we will come without any defense when we ask you, Lord, to shine the light into our hearts concerning our attitude and our convictions about someone of a different color and a different background and a different um, culture. I pray, Lord, that we will not come defensive, but that we will come open because you we are safe when you operate on our hearts we desire that in the name of jesus father i want to pray your blessing over sicil and over france as they leave us on a new journey and we want to pray your blessing over them we want to say to them and and and, and remind them this morning that you are with them that your face shine upon them that you will care for them. We pray, Father, that, that where they go, they will be the salt and the light that you have called us all to be. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May you